In the next 45 minutes, hopefully, we'll talk about what research to design is. Um, what is it? But also, what is it not? And what then is on the border of this, what it is and what it's not. Um, and through the part of explanation, we will, of course, have to talk about what is then research. Um, what's so specific about design that we can actually research with it. Um, and that also brings us to different kinds of, of knowledge, levels of knowledge that we can gather while we are doing research through design. Um, so what are design exemplars? Um, what are strong concepts and uh, annotated portfolios? And to conclude, I will of course explain why I am in the chair and why you should actually be able to talk about research to design. What's in it for you? So let's follow a bit of the path of Sir Christopher Frame, 1993, and how we looked into research through design. Um, we see that the first word, of course, is research. Um, so what he did is looked into the dictionary and said, what is research? So we could see two different kinds of research. One is the research with a small r. Research, um, which he describes as the act of searching closely or carefully for or after a specified thing or person. Examples would be finding a bed to stay in, uh, to go over the night, or using clues and evidence to find a criminal if they're talking about a detective, they're researching something. However, there's also a research with a big R, and the introduction is a bit later of this one. Um, and here it's work towards work directed towards the innovation, introduction, and improvement of products and processes. Examples would be more of what you would know: the worlds of chemistry, architecture, physics, heavy industry and also experiments in the social sciences. So research as a professional practice will deserve it. Research with the big R. Um, and that means that we have two kinds of research. So I have one with a big R and one with a small R. Um, and we're talking about research through design. The interesting thing is that we're talking about mainly the one with big R. Um, and of course, the second word of research to design is also an interesting part. So if we have research over here, and we design over here, of course, we can put something else between. Um, and basically, we can start with research into design, which is the act of looking at different kinds of research, and especially different kinds of arts. Um, think of art history. So what does it actually mean? So if we compare it to the social and contextual uh, environment, what does the, 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 the thing, the artifact in itself mean? Uh, it's basically something that really existed for a very long time. It's pretty different from what we say when we're talking about research through design. However, we can also talk about design as research or uh, in a later version, actually in an earlier version, uh, Christopher called it research for design. And here it starts to get complicated because we're not talking about the research with a small r. So we are looking at um, things we are looking into. So it's more about the reference materials that we use, it's about um, what to make. And the things, he argues, um, of related work that goes into the device or into the system or into the artifact, we can actually see it in the artifact itself. So the knowledge is also kept within the artifact. Uh, possibly. This is not always the case, but it can possibly be. And then we're talking about research for design. Um, so these are three different things, right? And if you look at the research through design, we have to go a bit deeper and see some examples of what that means. So we just talked about research for design. Um, it's for gathering the refer reference materials 
It's about getting inspiration and, and knowing what kind of things have been made to inspire you to make your own artifact. So research for design. Um, but now let's turn to the interesting one of research through design, where design gets a more focal uh, element or a more focal role. And in order to understand this, I think you have to know that design thinking is really uh, core to this idea of design put it in the center. So if we talk about the definition of design thinking or what people describe, I think it's interesting to use Zimmerman's um, description from the paper of 2007. Um, we mean the application of design process that involves grounding and uh, investigation to gain multiple perspectives on a problem. So this often uh, includes relating it to theories, behavioral theories, uh, and so even more often uh, relating it to contextual analysis, really understanding what the problem is and really to find different kinds of perspectives, but also reframing the problem. The second step will be ideation, generating of many possible different solutions. This is also typical for the design thinking, uh, the design thinking way. And then we're talking about iteration. So we have this cyclical process of refining the concept with increasing fidelity, with increasing insights and using and improving the thing while we are creating it. And of course, the last step, and also very important for the course that we are in, is reflection. And these four things, grounding, ideation, iteration, and reflection, make this design thinking a central role. And I think this is also central to any form of uh, research through design as I see it. Then, of course, it's also important what do we design? What kind of problems are we working on? And when we notice that it's about design thinking and the way of working, and we see that often designly activities are considered about uh, when we're talking about wicked problems. A wicked problem, as explained in Simon uh, 2007, um, is a problem that has conflicting perspectives of the stakeholders. It cannot be accurately modeled simply because of these conflicting um, perspectives. And it cannot be addressed using reductionist approaches of science and engineering. It's not just simply stating a set of requirements and then solving it or improving the performance of it. Um, examples are, I think, the projects that you're working right on, uh, on right now. How can we get people um, to have a better life during this corona um, outbreak? Right? It's a wicked problem and it's something that we have addressed in a certain kind of way. And we allow us to reframe the problem and reframe thinking ways of your working and we reframe the kind of directions we're going in. Uh, other examples are the contradictions that we see when we're talking about el people from elderly age and how long they should be able to stay in their homes. So on the one hand, they want to stay in their home, at the other hand, their uh, children and their people in their surrounding want to be uh, want them to be safe, right? So we see a, a conflict in, in the perspectives of the stakeholders. And we have to make choices and think about what kind of ways that we're actually approaching this problem. And that's what makes it a wicked problem. It's unconstrained, it's under constraint, can't be easily modeled, you can't just simply get it into uh, a set of requirements, which makes it different from more traditional engineering approaches and makes it a different kind of uh, way of thinking that can be really beneficial. So we talked a bit about um, Christopher Frayling, who started in 1993, um, who wondered about what's the role of art and design in research, um, and when do we deserve a PhD, for instance. So that's a very nice chapter also, um, or a report in 1997 about when do people actually get their PhD. And one of the things that are put forward there is also the importance of the process. So it's not often not only the product, but it's also the report of the process um, that's important. And so now we go to, I think, the first complete description of what research to design is, uh, which is an application or an adaptation from this view from uh, Christopher Freiling into HCI, HCI research by Zimmerman, uh, Zimmerman Polizzi and Evanston, this 2007 paper. Um, one last word we need to discuss is the word inquiry. Inquiry is a method to gain knowledge. 
Um, so you're probably familiar with ethnographic studies, right? So doing an anthropological field study to really understand how people um, behave in, in their own context and also to get familiar and really integrate into the context to really be able to understand what they are doing. Um, so that's the mode of inquiry. Another mode of inquiry will be experimental research where you have a hypothesis, you have a theory to make the hypothesis on and we make a study to test it out. Um, so these are modes of inquiry. So now Zimmerman says, well, uh, a model for design research is that it advances the work uh, of the design research community. So this, this model of research to design uh, by expanding the focus on methods and analysis of artifacts to include making as a method of inquiry in order to address wicked problems, which we just discussed. Um, so this research to design approach um, is something where designers produce novel integrations of ATI research in an attempt to make the right thing, a product that transforms the world from its current state to a preferred state. Um, and to do this, we talked about this design thinking, right? So we have something about grounding their explorations in real knowledge produced by, for instance, these anthropologists doing ethnographic studies and the design research is performing the upfront research. So maybe this, uh, this research for design um, or design project in order to know what they will be making. And there's an active process of ideating, iterating and critiquing potential solutions and design research is then continually reframe the problem as they attempt to make the right thing. The final output of this activity is then uh, a concrete problem framing and articulation of the preferred state and a series of artifacts. So it's not just one thing. Uh, models, prototypes, products and documentation of the design process. So what I really want to emphasize here that in this view uh, from Zimmerman 2007, uh, Palesi and Apes 2007, um, both the process and the artifact are part of research to design. This means that there are three roles for design in research. Um, we could see design research is in service of a research community, working to help researchers ground and frame problems and communicate their impact. The second one would be a design research as a critique, uh, as a critic of the ACI community, making artifacts that stimulate discussion and uh, of critical issues and to readdress issues. Uh, this is also known as, um, we'll touch the later upon, about speculative design and critical design. And then the third version is design research is as pattern finders and finding patterns that lead to pattern languages. In order to understand this, you briefly need to know about, um, I think the name was Alexander Christopher, who introduced the, the notice of, of pattern languages from uh, architects, for me. And later on, this is also applied in computer science. Um, where you can see that certain elements are being reused um, when designing something. And by reusing these things, uh, you, can you can create a certain pattern. So if uh, the, the situation or the problem is like this, uh, this is the pattern which we can use in order to tackle that. Um, and of course, this is uh, something you've been seeing in a lot of papers. Tips and, tips, uh, tips and tricks about how to um, design something in a certain situation, in a certain context. So to conclude, uh, Simon's view, he says, well, we expect research projects to take this research through design approach that they will also ignore or de-emphasize perspectives in framing the problem, um, such as the detailed economics uh, associated with manufacturability and distribution, the integration of the product into a product line, the effect of product on the company's identity, etc. And this has to do with the fact that we are thinking and we're aiming in research to design to gain knowledge. We're not aiming to create products that actually function in the world. You, the main goal of the research to design is to create something that adds up upon the knowledge. It's not uh, the main goal can't be the, the product and its viability. So that means that often in these research approaches, this is also something that does not get this, um, this emphasis. We are not talking about the detailed economics, we're not talking about manufacturability uh, or the integration of the product into a product line. So this also means that there is a challenge because where does the money come from? Well, of course, we have a government that gives research projects, research um, goals in order to do these kinds of things so we know better of how to design a, pro a product. Uh, but at the same time, we often need money from the industry in order to cooperate in this sense. 
And the majority of design research is actually paid by the development industry. It's unlikely that this information, which provides a significant competitive advantage, would then be openly shared. Um, so this is also a tension that is really, really currently, I think, to really consider when we are collaborating with stakeholders and collaborating with parties from industry. And there are ways to deal with it, but it's definitely a challenge. Um, if we look at a later def the definition from uh, 2010 from Zimmermann, Stoltenmann and Kulitzi, um, then describe it as a research approach that employs methods and processes from design practice as a legitimate method of inquiry. So almost in the same direction. Um, so I think this is just a good first glimpse of what research to design is. Where Zimmerman proposed design patterns, generalizations over different kind of artifacts and rules that they can be extracted from it, Bill Gaper in his 2012 paper about what should we expect from research to design actually proposes the, um, the opposite, you could say, because um, he proposes annotated portfolios, uh, like the description of uh, Stoppers and Giacardi uh, in their book chapter about research to design, uh, which says annotated portfolios are, allow one to compare different individual items to relevant dimensions uh, of their de design domain, and the designer's opinion about the relevant places and configurations to adapt on these dimensions. So you have a set of drawings or pictures or um, depictions at least of the artifact with annotations of the author or the designers around that. So they explain what it's actually about it. They articulate the ideas and the issues that join and differentiate them. So it's quite interesting that these things are different kinds of outcomes of what we are doing with research to design. And these are not the only types of knowledge or forms of outcome or maybe kinds of theory that we could, uh, could have. So in the same paper, Bill Gaffer also uh, explains that you could have theory in its own right. For instance, the importance of um, body, bodily movement in a design process, um, as you could, uh, could see in judging Dini Dodd's research, according to him, uh, which also what he also did with students, maybe somewhat similar to what we're doing in the course designing interactive experiences. Um, and you can also have borrowed conceptual perspectives. So you take a theory and you will try to apply it to an HCI domain. Um, an example there, you could have the idea of Gibson's ecological psychology, which we most often know as uh, affordances already in the HCI domain. Um, and you can adapt that to, for instance, uh, something that's also called irresistibles, right? Things that you don't want to, that you really uh, can't take your hands off. Um, except for theory and borrowed conceptual perspectives, he also discusses manifestos. And of course, these have a stronger opinion uh, in them and why you should do something. Uh, an example, he calls his own uh, ludic approach or a playful approach to designing and why products might be uh, gaining more when they have sort of a playful attitude in them. And you could also have frameworks for design. Um, so these are less focused on the theoretical commitments or this normative stance of which you could find in a manifesto, but they do include um, suggestions for methods to approach each stage and factors that are involved in designing products. And if you look at this map, um, we can see that you could have at the top, you could have something called the theory, and at the top, you could, at the bottom, you could have the, the practice layer. And in between, we can have different kinds of things. So we can, of course, have a practice, which is just the artifact itself, which is not very useful. And we can have a very abstract theory, which we can't apply in HCI. Um, so that's very interesting or to see it as a different kind of perspectives of where we are uh, with the kind of knowledge that we are proposing. Um, so there are different kinds of intermediate forms of this knowledge. And I like this overview of task management. So what we can see is uh, a few things. So the design patterns we already discussed. And then we have heuristics, which most of you would know, and the related uh, idea of guidelines design guidelines, then we see strong concepts, conceptual constructs, and bridging concepts. And these actually go from a layer of how much they are, are originating from theory and how much they actually deducted from uh, the practice. So let's start with bridging concepts by Dalskart and Binder, which they proposed. Um, so they are in the, in the middle, you could say. So they both originate from theory and, um, and practice, and often they can use exemplars. Exemplars is a very interesting point because that is a, um, a significant or ideal example of an artifact. 
in that sense that it embodies the properties of the concept reflecting this then from theory and practice to better comprehend and demonstrate applicability uh, across a range of use cases. And this not only goes for uh, bridging concepts, you don't only have an artifact uh, which you can call an exemplar for a bridging concept, but you can have it in different kinds of, um, of, of these types of knowledge, that the artifact really shows what kind of knowledge is embedded inside the, the thing. Again, this also relates, of course, what we already discussed with trailing and this idea how artifacts can actually embed knowledge in some cases. Um, so back to preaching context. Um, so the original from both the theory and the practice, um, and an example could be something called, they call peoples. They are related to Dewey pragmatism, which I don't need to explain uh, because you don't need to know about the theory actually that's here in order to understand the idea of the, the version concept because on one hand it relates to the theory and they can explain how it works on the other hand it's based on the practice and deduction from several um, several kind of, of things they can could see in, in, in happening in the literature um, and what they propose is the idea of peoples um, where you can have a device which only shows part of it part of the larger world through it so you imagine, uh, I think you have a, a thing that goes around the table in which you can view a map through. So you only see a part of the map and by actually physically uh, exploring, you can deduct more of it. Or how they call it, by peoples, we refer to interactive artifacts that provide a limited view into larger spaces. Um, peoples play on the tension between what is hidden and what's revealed to spark engagement. Um, so the second part that you saw was uh, on this display of uh, bridging concepts, strong concepts, which go closer to practice, and of course, then we're uh, closer to a theory, uh, conceptual concept. But on the bottom layer, we could say strong concepts. These are proposed by Hook and Lorgren, and in their paper, um, they, for instance, um, extract the idea of uh, social navigation. So there are several kind of papers and, and systems in, uh, in use which use social navigation. So, where other people went before to ease navigation, showing where other people went before to ease navigation. So, for instance, the, the stars in IMDb help you to show what kind of films other people watched, right? So, they help you to, to get an, an idea of, uh, of what you choose. Um, so, here the idea is more it's deducted from uh, the practice, but then it's linked back to, uh, to a theory. So, it's basically a bit closer to uh, the practice. And then we have conceptual constructs, um, which are introduced by a paper by Stoltzman and Wiewerk. Um, and these relate to concept-driven design. And actually there are two examples which have a very different kind of um, uh, background or a different kind of, of realization. Because the first one, the first example they give of a conceptual construct is uh, bricks, which were a form of very tangible user interaction, or um, how to describe it, they allow manipulation of digital objects by way of physical bricks placed on a larger horizontal table, um, which they could um, interact with. So you are digital objects, and by moving them, you could mani manipulate digital uh, physical objects, you could use to manipulate digital objects. Which now, of course, is a bigger thing with all kinds of tangible user interaction. Um, user interfaces. But it can also include concept designs as conceptual constructs. Um, this is a different uh, example, which is the Dynabook, which was a view basically towards the future. So it was a view on what a laptop could be in 1972, when there was not yet the technical possibility to have a laptop. Um, and this of course is a different kind of thing because the realization was not there yet. It also relates to the idea of a concept car in that sense, which is um, which is known from the automotive industry, which has a form of a, um, which is not functional ready yet. So it gives an idea and gives a future view of what might be possible, and you can use it to gain knowledge about users what they would like or not. Um, but it's it's not yet pro um, a producible instance. It's far from it actually. So, and the last form of this intermediate uh, knowledge um, was what you was, could see as heuristics. And of course, most of you will probably know heuristics. So the 10 heuristics of Newsom, for instance, 
And then the first one would be visibility of system status. So you can actually see what kind of state the system is in. Is it thinking, is it loading, these kinds of things. So these are broad rules of thumb. Um, they actually placed quite high towards the theory side, but uh, some of them can also be more related to the uh, actual practice practice based um, and we can also see guidelines which are sort of in the same um, uh, area um, but if you look at those research design papers that we just mentioned um, guidelines are not that mentioned not that often mentioned as outcomes um, so if you look at the Dow Jude and McKay paper um, on uh, book chapter actually on research design they also mentioned that guidelines uh, might oversimplify design problems and provide more value towards the review of existing designs over the creation of new designs. Um, based on all sources, they said guidelines rarely explain how to manage conflicts between the rules, nor do they encourage truly innovative design. And of course, this is a bit, bit of a harsh critique because it can be very helpful in, order, in a certain domain to, to get some guidelines about what would work and what might not work. Um, but that would span up our kind of knowledge that we can generate with research and design. So what is research to design not? What is it not? Um, so it's basically not product design, right? I think we've seen it already a bit. We're not trying to develop preliminary versions of devices. We're not doing market research. Um, we're not looking into the detailed economics, as Simon one told, or manufacturability or the distribution, the product line. These things are really not have a place inside research design. We're not looking at company identities or, um, or making a successful uh, commercial product. Instead, we are trying to find out what is the right thing to make and gaining knowledge. Um, so Frailing also discussed things like operation research and management science, and these things are not what we're doing. This is a really different kind of field, a different kind of research, or a different kind of, of design. Uh, it's also not engineering, because in engineering design, it's, uh, there's a more constructive, a, a more constrained problem to be solved. Um, if you take the words of Zimmerman uh, from his 2007, pa 2007 paper, um, so engineering design developers created software to meet a specification and in creative design designers continually reframe the problem constantly actually questioning the underlying assumptions during the design process whereas engineers first develop a specification of what they need to make to meet the specific need um, so in engineering um, this just often means as, uh, as a demonstration that the performance is looked at uh, performance increase or that the function actually works um, as a form of their contribution. It's also not a form of personal development, right? So if you're just making something or learn something from that, um, we did it and, and, and we can't really uh, make that explicit to other people. Um, and it just becomes tacit knowledge in that sense. So tacit knowledge is things that we know and we apply, but it's not made explicitly. So if you bake an egg, uh, which is a nice example of phrasing, um, if we bake an egg, we have a recipe, but at the same time, we have all kinds of knowledge that we uh, incorporate. We know how to handle a pan, we know how to uh, add a bit of, of oil, we know that the, the gas should be turned on, and, and actually that it also should be ignited. So these kinds of things are all tacit knowledge, whereas the recipe is an explicit knowledge, so we can really follow it. Um, so to come back to this idea of not personal development, um, as long as we do not, not really, this is again the words of Zimmerman, if we not include the motivation for their work, the detail and current situation and the preferred states are missing without this practical component, a research design approach appears to be self-indulgent, personal exploration and importance to researchers which make no promise to impact the world. And such a private learning, often in intuitive and less tacit, should not be counted as research results because it's not shared with others. And this is a words of Stappers and Iacardi. It's also not just the next step, right? So we're making things, but it's, it's not innovative enough. It's also not research design. So research contributions should be artifacts that demonstrate significant invention. The contributions should be novel integrations of theory, technology, user need, and context, not just refinements of products that already exist in the research literature or commercial markets. The contribution must demonstrate a significant advance through the integration that they're doing. Again, the words of Simon and Um 
Um, it's also not experimental design, so it's not a, a, a typical kind of abstract logical research. Um, seldom ever we see hypothesis, and especially not the hypothesis testing with falsification. Um, so unlike lab-based you know, works of life, unlike lab-based uh, experimental studies, research design seldom if ever states is hypothetically tested. Uh, it's also not experimental research in the sense that uh, you could have research design, which is a, a great confusion if you talk to psychologists, because they call making the design study, so to investigate with experimental design a certain phenomena, they call that research design. Um, of course, there's a part of design in to do that, but um, it's really not what research design is. And that, I think, sums up what all the kinds of things that it's not. If you look at the different kind of definitions for research design, you see a focus on both the process and the artifact or design. You also see um, a focus on, on the output, the knowledge that should be gained, instead of um, the product that's created as a commercial successful thing. So what if it happens if the process or the product are not part of the research to design process? Um, then we can come into this kind of border area, although I think the key figures from our field would definitely view it as still part of uh, research design. Actually, most of the examples from research design papers which explain what research design is, use these kinds of examples as well. Um, and it brings us to the idea of design fictions, where it's uh, not so much about how the product should be, but maybe also about how the thing should not be. And there's a very nice explanation about the probable, the possible, and, um, and, and what you want to have as a society or not. Uh, if you talk about this critical and spe speculative design, which are uh, forms of design fictions. So take, for instance, the, the paper by Gottschall uh, in Kai 2015, where they analyzed an art project called the menstruation machine, which is basically a video of a non-functional project uh, product. Uh, which makes a clear po point about considering what menstruation means in our society. At the same time, we see that it's not related to a process and it's actually not related to the product because they're not the one generating the product. But still, they show how you can analyze it, um, which of course then brings the question is that still research design? Because it comes very close to what our colleagues uh, at Philosophy of Science, Technology, and Society would do um, with uh, analyzing what kind of intentions and what kind of societal impact it would have. But not by actually, in first hand, um, creating or designing the thing. So, but there are actually a lot of those design fictions which also relate to how things would be and how things could be. 
which are preferred state. So a, a good example of this is the Dynabook that we already discussed, which was a very early idea of a laptop in, in already in, um, uh, by Alan Kay already in 1968. Um, and it looks a bit like this. You can see it's a clear example of, of how we could make something, uh, of, put a, for, a fishing forward in order to know what to make um, and know what kind of technological uh, things we would need for that. So maybe there's an interesting stuff also happening outside these borders when we do not include the process or we do not include the product, um, but it's already on the borders of research to design. And that already brings us to the last two points, um, which is why should you care and be able to explain what research design is? Well, you have to be able to articulate why design thinking is powerful and helps you to keep on doing, because it helps you also to keep on doing the things you probably like most, right? The designing and actually creating these things. Um, especially in a research setting, this is important. Perhaps also in the industry, you can convince people that this design thinking and the design activities can actually help you to gain knowledge. Um, you can explain also to your friends at birthdays and other parties, if you uh, are allowed again, to go to these kinds of things, that why is this master worry? Why is this actually science? Why is it research? Um, although you might have to tinker every now and then, the goal in equity is actually the acquisition of knowledge, um, shareable knowledge to others. And you have seen different kinds of ways you can do that. In this case, a very clear answer to why you can consider this as a master worthy course, but even a master worthy study sometimes. Uh, and you need to be able to explain why your suggestion is, um, is a preferred state, right? So why your artifact is very important that you can explain this is a preferred kind of thing. And it's a very part, um, that's a very important part also of one of those pillars for, for interaction design, which is uh, about storytelling, really being able to convince uh, other people that this is the right thing um, and being able to explain why it is as it is and using different kinds of media to also show this it within the artifact. Um, but more importantly, maybe for this course and for you, uh, it's also one of the learning tools. You are required to mention it in your individual reflection video. This at least requires you to simply add a sentence from one of the definitions, right? To say this is research to design. Um, but I would even like you to try to share knowledge in a way that fits that. So if you have a, uh, have a definition that, that we or in a, in a according paper that we shows this focus on process is important, then refer to the recording process that you did and to record uh, to the process video that you made. Uh, and maybe you have a lesson about that. Uh, if you say the definition and the paper that points towards the guidelines will be the bomb, I haven't found one yet, but it can be a very, uh, very nice thing, then provide more practical elements and these kind of guidelines, right? Um, and if you state it's about generating theory and more abstract forms, they probably also end up with these more abstract suggestions. So that's very nice if you can really try to also uh, link these two. So if your definition of research design also fits the kind of output that you generate with your project. Um, but it's not just a learning goal, it's a very important learning goal. Uh, it's actually the only one that, that we discussed during the last accreditation of this master of interaction technology. So where is the research to design? It was a, a good question by the professor who was in, the, in that committee, and Schouten, uh, and we had a friendly discussion about it. And I really pointed also towards this course and how we, how we deal with that. Um, because it is very important for research, this research to design for the masters as interaction design, but I also believe for interest to design engineering. Um, but it also shows that not every researcher actually knows, uh, even within our field, that what research to design makes research to design. Um, and I think for many of you, this is also the course where we go into a certain level of depth uh, from the theoretical background of what it means, as well as actually applying it and, and trying to, to do it for yourself. And then the last point, why am I a chair? Well, this is actually based on research for design. Because once you start something like that, of course, you have reference materials. And what you would see is these two pictures, um, and people are basically either giving a presentation, or like these two pictures, are giving um, the kind of knowledge, sharing them, where they are sitting in the chair. Uh, 